You have so much power in the way that you show up in your family. Be the sister on the side of the door. Be the sister that offers the car. Be the sister that writes the dang letter. And hug your people. Hug your people. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Because it's worth it. Hi there. Welcome back to the Mindset Check podcast. I'm your host, Misha McKittrick. This is a podcast where we believe that as you take time for a mindset check, you have more power than you think you do. And where we also believe that the way you show up in your family relationships matters. In the very first season of the Mindset Check podcast, we are reading through my journal of when I was 15 and pregnant. And we're at a point in the story where My sister, Shelly, has kind of come up a lot in some of the stories. And so we decided to have her on as a guest. (laughs) I asked listeners what they had as far as questions for Shelly, and they submitted some really great questions for Shelly. We talked all kinds of things about how did we become so close at a young age and what keeps us close as we you know, go through our lives. We talked about all of her feelings, you know, the, the other side of the story, sort of getting some background and some inside to the story that you don't get when you only hear me tell it. We talk about how she felt about keeping Jesse's infidelity from me when she found out he actually lied to me about already telling me. So that's like a big ball of yarn we untangle. We talk about, you know, how the loss of a parent affected our relationship. And we talk about advice we have for you or anyone really who's struggling with their relationship with their sister or a sibling. We really dive into a lot of things. So let's just get started and jump right in. Hi, Shell. Hi. <laughs> Oh, this is so exciting for you to be here in this space with me. I'm just so grateful that you are a willing and that you're the kind of sister that we get to dive into a lot of things we're going to talk about today. Yeah. (laughs) I'm excited, a little nervous, but it'll be fine. (laughs) I have a little bit of a cold, so I sound kind of funny. That's okay. People still can understand and, and feel you through that. Yeah. Okay. So diving in and talking about sisters, some of the things that I was looking up last night, I came across two different things and I felt like they described both of our, both of my sisters. And I'll tell you what they are in just a second. I think it's interesting that, you know, we are actually, I'm actually the middle of two sisters. And so I have an older sister by three years and a younger sister by three years. And like I've said in other episodes and other things that we've talked about, our younger sister was much younger during this time. And she was very much removed from a lot of the, a lot of the stuff that Shelly was very privy to and, and really involved with. And so that's why this conversation really applies to Shelly, but in um, April's honor, (laughs) I found this quote and it said, being sisters means that you always have a backup. (laughs) I thought you would laugh, yep. but you're going to cry. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> it's so true. <laughs> and right. Yeah. That just yeah. describes April to a T. Oh yeah. Yeah. She would fight to the end of the earth for you. Yeah. It's so true. It is so true. And um, I remember a time in Vegas when <clears throat> I was, I, I took this parking spot that was rightfully mine, <laughs> but these people were going to like beat me up over it. And they literally were waiting for me and threatening me. And I was like, and April was meeting me at the place we were at. And I was like, April. And she's like, where are you at? And she comes around the corner and her on her motorcycle. And she's like, <laughs> and they just drove away. Like she was ready. She got off with her chap- chaps. Do you say chaps or chaps? I don't know. <laughs> right. Gaps, I think. I don't know what it is, but yeah. <laughs> she got off and she like and she like looked at them like anyway, it didn't take much. That was it. <laughs> yeah. So, and then the next quote 
described you to me and it says this sisters. And I know April would be right in line with what I'm saying here. She's, it says sisters are blessed with an extra sense that whispers when the other needs them. And that is my sister, Shelly to a T she's, she knows exactly when and where and how to show up. And I swear shell that there are many circumstances that have happened in my life and you happened to be there when they went down. Yeah. <laughs> I just kind of get these feelings. I'm very attentive to what people need. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I just make sure I'm there. Yeah. Yeah. 100%. <laughs> okay. So this is what we're going to start with. So I have a list of questions from listeners and they're really fantastic questions Okay, and I'm excited to dive into them. But the one that I want to really start with, it says, what do you think really helped you guys to have a close relationship, especially in those teen years and what things keep you close? I have so many things I could say around this topic. You do? (laughs) Yes. (laughs) Yes. I don't feel like it was any different because I feel like we've been close our whole life yeah I know that our parents taught us we were taught that our family is there for you your family is gonna family is gonna help you and protect you they're gonna be there for you when you need something they're gonna be the ones that you call on and you know you need to stay close with them and build those relationships so that you can depend on that yeah so I just feel like that was just kind of there my whole life and we just have been close the whole time um I'm close with both you and April um each relationship's a little bit differently because we are different people yeah you're different than April and I guess in a way it's like what dad used to do Mm -hmm. and he used to focus on the person and what they liked Mm -hmm. and hang out with them in those aspects yeah where you meet April is different than where I meet April and where I meet, you know, where you meet me is different than where you meet April. So forth. A hundred percent. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I think it's kind of interesting because I think we're going to describe a life. That's really like, that has some really amazing stories <laughs> and really cool things. Um, you know, I think oh, one of the things that our parents did well in retrospect, I think what, what I'm really trying to say is, is that, we definitely still fought a lot growing up, you know, like normal siblings, you know, I swear we couldn't like, for sure. Yeah. We couldn't lay on opposite ends of the couch without starting like a, you know, a kicking war <laughs> <laughs> or all of the funny stories about our mud fights and our paint fights and our water fights. And Shelly, will you paint my nails and painting all my fingers and you know, <laughs> all of those stories. Um, mm-hmm. I, I think that one of the things that our parents did is, is they really made an, a priority with family. So for example, you know, do you remember when we'd go on camping trips and I don't know if it was just me and my personality, but I was always like, can I bring a friend? Can I bring a friend? Oh, oh, can I, you know, and yeah. they were always like, it's no, it's family. It's family only. Yep. Yeah. Did you ever ask to bring friends? Uh, every once in a while. Yeah. Not as often as you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. But it was definitely always the answer. Like, no, this is our time to be with our family. And I think parents kind of feel up against a wall with that. Sometimes they feel like they should be bringing friends and and friends are great, but I don't think that there's anything wrong with just taking a stand and saying, no, we're going to be with our family. Well, I mean, just being with your family forces you to have those relationships and build those relationships I feel like Mm -hmm. not really forces but I mean you have no other option you're always bringing your friends and you're always bringing something else you're going to be distant from the rest of the from your sister or your brother or whoever it is in your family so always bringing those friends doesn't allow that's the word I should say allow for those relationships to grow Right. Because you're not communicating with those people. You're communicating with a friend all the time. Right. When it's just your family, I mean, we definitely had our ups and our downs, like you said. Um, 
there are for sure some times where I can remember being so mad that I couldn't stand it, but (laughs) we got over it. We fixed it, (laughs) we figured it out, you know, like you just figure things out. But I feel like that was one of the main things that drove our relationships too, is we did spend a lot of time as just families. Yeah. Sundays was mostly just family time. Yeah. There were no interactions with friends. It was very rare if there was. Yeah. Um, we used to have family dinners. We would go on family walks, um, different things like that, that just kind of, we spent a lot of time together. When you're spending time together, you see the good. Yeah. You see a lot of good. Yeah. And I think sometimes, you know, if you're not spending that time, you're not able to see the good. You're only seeing the bad and the upset and the mad. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know, so you mm-hmm. got to have the good too to go with that other yeah. stuff. Yeah. You know, being annoyed that your sister's like <laughs> painting your hand with her fingernail polish or starting, starting a leg war or locking <laughs> you in the bathroom or out of the house or whatever it may be. <laughs> that you, that you, you know, you just got to. Yeah. So if you're only seeing that part, there's no force to make a good relationship. Yeah. Yeah. And I think we were definitely taught to forgive and move on, you know, and just oh, like, yeah. mm-hmm. don't dwell on that. Like, just, just get over it. You know, she's your sister or whatever. I think that there's yeah. definitely an undertone that our parents carried. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. Kelly, how about the strawberry shortcake necklace story? <laughs> about that. That's a fun one. <laughs> That I feel like is like the epitome of our relationship and of your heart. And I will tell it because it's about you. Okay. I was so, going to say, I don't want to tell that. <laughs> <laughs> well, if I mess it up, you tell me. But yeah, so we got, got these, we got these matching strawberry shortcake necklaces. And, you know, that's when it was all of the, all the thing to have strawberry shortcake. It was like so in. And I think our parents brought it home from us for a trip that they went on or something. Am I right? Yeah. 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 And, um, so we had these matching necklaces and I lost my necklace and it meant so much to me. Like I was distraught. I was super sad. I spent time like, cause I knew I lost it. I had gone on a bike ride and I, I spent so much time just like walking up and down the streets, you know, involving whatever family members would get on the train and help me. And I had this moment. Well, I, I don't even know how long it had been, Shell. Maybe you know, but my sister Shelly just I came don't to, remember. Yeah. Yeah. You just came to me and you just gave me your necklace. You just gave me your necklace. You said, here, take mine. Yeah. <laughs> and um and then I don't know how much longer after that we actually found my necklace and it had been run over by a car and it had this little black dot and you kept my necklace that was, you know, altered, defaced a little. Yeah. You kept mine. Why did you do that? Like, did I, did I, was I being selfish or were you being giving? I don't know. I don't know. I don't remember that part. I just remember us like looking at it because I remember we were together when we found it. Okay. Um, and I remember looking at it on, and we, I was like, here it is. And we picked it up and, <laughs> and I was, it was more like a scratch on the back of it, not just a dot. It went across the back. I don't think, I, I think the front was a little bit defaced because it had been down on the rock. So there was it was a black, like, the little, yeah, there was a black dot on the front of it. Okay. I don't yeah, remember. That I part. remember distinctly. <laughs> okay. yeah. Um and I I just remember I don't remember if you had said anything or anything like that. I just said, I'll just take this one since you already have the other one. Oh my gosh. And here's the thing too. Sh- Shelly, you gave me your necklace and then you were still there looking for mine with me. Yeah. Yeah. That's who you are. Yeah. That ne- that necklace story happened when we were maybe seven and 10. Yeah, probably something like that. Yeah. And that just is who you are. So I think, um, I think our parents created a lot of fun at our house, mom doing the, you know, the water fights and you and mom were just like a team and I hated it. And it was hilarious. (laughs) 
and super funny. And then um, dad did some things that I noticed when we were older and it made me think about, I don't know what he did when we were younger, but he did a lot of things to like really keep us close. Yeah. You know, one of those things was uh, he, he started leaving us a, a gift at Christmas that was cash. And he left us that cash so that we could, and it was only to be used for a sister date so that we would go and do something all together as sisters. Yep. And that was a really cool thing. And then do you remember when dad, when we started to hit like teen years and when we would start to kind of like go separate ways and dad would, he, he did this to me. So I'm wondering if he did it to you, he would tell me stories about one of my sisters and he would leave me hanging like a, like he would tell me like, oh, and then, and then, and he'd be like, you should ask her about it. Like he would leave the cliff. <laughs> <laughs> you know? <laughs> yeah. Did he do. do that? Did he do that to you? Probably not as much as he, to you. Yeah. You know, um, <laughs> I needed to be brought back in. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I just, me and April were mostly there all the time. And so it was you, kind of, you were out. So I feel like me and you were already spending a lot of time together. Mm-hmm. And dad knew that even like when you lived in Ogden and Milford, because I could drive. So I would go to those places a lot Yeah, already just to hang out, mm-hmm. just to see you, to see Taylee, to spend time. To build those relationships, I guess, is what I was craving, craving from those things is just Mm -hmm. to be around that. So Mm -hmm. instead of me hanging out and going with my friends, I was going to Ogden or, you know, Milford or wherever it was. And to me, that was fun. Sometimes my friends would be going up there and drop me off and they would go do whatever they're doing and I would just hang out. Yeah. But that was just where I wanted to be because that's the relationship that we had. Yeah. So. Yeah. yeah. Um, I mean, it wasn't every weekend or anything like that. I th- may, feel like I, maybe I said that a little bit much, but. Oh, no. I, you see it, was, it in the journals when you're like, oh, when I say, oh, Shelly was here. Oh, Shelly was yeah. here. You know, it's just. Yeah, constant. I went there quite often. Yeah. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, and I think that there's something important to note about what we just learned too, because. I think one of my friends had, has told me to parent your, your children the same. You, you actually have to parent them differently. So parent each child differently to parent them the same. Oh yeah. And so dad kind of knew that he needed to bring me in. Yeah. And I left for college and I was living in Arizona later and you guys were at home. So he had to really kind of make sure I was still very connected. Yes. And yeah, that was a tactic, I think, for sure. Oh, 100%. He definitely parented each one of us differently. Yeah. Because I remember, I mean, thinking back now, the things that me and him would go and do are totally different than what you and him would go and do or him and April would go and do. Mm-hmm. Or the time that we would spend together would be way different than any of the other things. So um, he really was just, so amazing and I just wish I could take all of his knowledge and all of the things that he did for me pass that on yeah to the people that I love so that they know how wonderful life can be yeah exactly okay so What do you think, what are some things that keep us close now, would you say, that we could offer and pass to others? I I mean, it's just spending time together, I feel like. Making that a priority? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, Seriously, like when when I used to come to to St. George a lot Mm -hmm. um, before Mason was born, I feel like we were way close and that was just because I was around you more. I spent way more time with you. Um, I just, yeah. So just so everyone knows, I used to work in St. George and I would spend a couple of nights a week at Misha's house and I would work in the office down there and then I would come home and work the week, you know, the few days at home and have the weekend. But I would spend two nights there with her, her family 
and just being able to see her that those two days and hang out in the morning in the evenings when we did just it just kept that relationship going yeah it was more one-on-one uh more face-to-face instead of Mm -hmm. I mean now we're close I feel like we're still close don't we're just not as close as we were there's just Um, there's just a a there's a bond and there's a, there's a, there is a, um, like a constant that when I call you and I'm like, Hey, shell. And you're like, yeah, what's up. (laughs) And there's just this constant sort of feeling between us that is like, you know, you never left off, but at the same time, you might not know the day to day, everyday happenings like you used to. Yep. That's what it is. Yeah. And so there's that difference, but I think that, I think that having, you know, the closeness and spending the time being close, I think makes you crave, you know, you feel it. And I feel it when we haven't been around each other for a hot minute. Yep. And for sure. Yeah. And we usually just, you know, plan a get together or whatever, hang out. Yeah. doesn't have to be a big thing. I mean, sometimes just even for me to go pick up April and just go to the store together, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. that's still just some one-on-one time where mm-hmm. we still get to have that. I mean, like me and you will go shopping if you're, that's what you're doing and you need to shop when I'm going down there, we'll just go together. It's yeah. not, it doesn't mm-hmm. necessarily have to be like something special or arranged or something. It's just like mm-hmm. doing whatever needs to be done at the time, but doing it together. Yeah. It doesn't yeah. have to be something that, you go above and beyond to make a plan to do. You just hang out. You're, yeah, just, you, it's fun to be together. Just hang out. And then, hang out and be silly and yeah. do silly things. And Turn on the music and dance. and Oh, 100% that. Laugh with each other and yep. catch up with each other's kids. And yeah, it's such a beautiful, a beautiful dynamic. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And another thing about my sisters and my family is you truly are who you are with them. Mm -hmm. They know you Mm -hmm. in and out 100%. There's no, it's not different. There's nothing, you know what I mean? It's just, you know, each other very well. You spent your whole life with each other growing up. Mm So I, I know, I know how to, make my sisters mad yeah. I know how to make my sisters happy <laughs> you know I mean like yeah. I know so much about my sisters and that's just because we did spend as much time as we did together and those are the things that are awesome that I can just like hang out with them make them happy I know one simple little thing that I could do for both of them that if they're having a bad day or they need something that I could do that one thing and it can flip their day for them and I know it will Just because I know that that will help them to get them where they need to go. Yeah. One thing that I think that mom really showed us is, do do you know, mom has this like term or this thing that she says that she says, oh, are they hurting for certain? Yeah. Okay. And what that means is, you know, or, or when she's describing something that someone's in a bad way, she'll say, oh, they're hurting for certain. Or she'll say, are they hurting for certain? She just, that's kind of her descriptor. And that's a way when mom moves in, that she just moves in with such grace and such, um, how can I assist? How can I make it better? How can I, you know, I think you channel a lot of that from mom. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And so there's definitely giving each other the benefit of the doubt sometimes. And we're going to have roller coasters in life. And sometimes where we're not showing up very well and you have to, you know, continue to see each other as your highest and best self and as your, your best possibility. Yeah. And just love, just love. Love. Yeah. Yeah. Love is the the root of it all. I think is just love. Yeah. And it always pays off. Oh, 100%. Yeah. It always pays off. Okay, so this drops us into a question that's that's a little bit deeper about the story. And this person says, I wondered how your sister found out you were pregnant 
and how she first felt about it. And I don't remember. I found out the day you told mom and dad. That night? Uh Uh-huh. We were all in the living, we were all in the living room. Even April. Yeah. Yeah. So you guys, the kid, you, you and April went to bed because I remember waiting for you guys to go to bed to tell mom and dad. And then dad had gone to bed and I just, I told mom and then she went and woke up dad. And so dad out of a dead sleep comes out. And I know it was just the four of us because okay. he made Jesse, um, no mom, mom. She's such a freaking rock star. She said, Misha, you told me, I think it's Jesse's turn to tell your father. Ooh. Snap, <laughs> <laughs> crackle, pop. That's right. So, yeah. <laughs> so, so how and where do you remember? Did they go wake you up? No, maybe not. Maybe it was later a different day. I don't know. Yeah. But I remember us all being in the living room and that's how I found out. Uh-huh. We were told, and it was probably dad saying, you need to tell your sisters first before it gets to them because yeah. he was big about that. He was big about like, yeah, you need, we need to come together. We need to all stand on the same thing. We need to, you know, be together on this. Mm-hmm. This is ours. This is what we're going to do. We have a plan. This is how we're, you know. You get everyone on your page or as much on your page as you could, I guess. I guess everyone could have went rogue and did whatever they wanted to. But I remember us being in, I remember finding out in a big, all of us there. You, Jesse, mom, dad, April, and me. And I remember, I don't even know who said it or what was, I just remember that. And then I remember me and April being sent downstairs. So there was more discussion happening on the subject got it so and I remember some things that I said to you because I wasn't very happy Uh in that moment or just later 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 Mm -hmm. I don't like to admit them really (laughs) you you did tell me about them and I was like I do not remember that yeah so I yeah I said some and it was just I don't know if it was, it was probably just at a very emotional time. I mean, like, and also I was trying to process it myself and know what we were doing and what was happening and all of these things, like what was going to, you know what I mean? And all those things I think were going through me on myself. Um, And I remember during this time that we were really, we did hang out a lot during those times. I mean, we were hanging out before that happened a lot. We were doing a lot of things together, uh, going to a lot of uh, places together and hanging out and stuff like that. So I don't know if my, I think part of my, (laughs) what drives me is I need to be included. I need to be one of those, like, Uh that's what I need to be accepted is my thing. And so I felt probably that I wasn't included. Like, how dare you not tell, tell me about this? Yeah. Uh-huh. And how dare maybe you? tell like, mom and dad before you? Yeah, I guess. I don't know. I don't remember yeah. ever feeling that way. But I don't, I'm just trying to remember, like, I'm just trying to go back to that place and say, why did I react like that? Because mm-hmm. I'm not usually like that. Yeah, no, for sure. So I don't, I don't, I, that's the only thing maybe I can think is I just was trying to process it. And it was probably like a how, what? Yeah. But why, why am I finding out about this like this? You know what I mean? Kind of a thing. Yeah. And that's okay. That's the way you needed to do it for you. Yeah. But um, you felt wounded a little. Maybe. It yeah. might have been that because I feel like I was trying to wound you back. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's so tricky. Yeah. yeah. And and like I said, I don't, I really don't even remember, you know, Yeah. just to clear it up for the audience. I feel like that. It's just simply a name that Shelly probably doesn't even want to call me. <laughs> and she called it, she called me it, and I really do not remember. And it's probably because that's not the permeating feeling that lasted with you that, you know what I mean? It was like, yeah. 
it was like a moment, a hot moment. And then it was like, you know, turned around and, and you just loved. Yeah. I mean, I cooled down. You gave yeah. me my space. You knew that that's what I needed. I needed space. I needed time to process. I needed time to like figure it out. And then after that, I'm pretty sure we had our forgiving moments and our apologies. I'm pretty sure I said, sorry. Yeah. Um, and apologize. And then after that, it's just kind of like forgotten and move on. Yeah. yeah. And because that's just how it was done. That's how, what we did. You like figured things out. Yeah. We weren't allowed to muster in anger. I wouldn't say allowed. We were encouraged to get through hard times with each other. Instead of letting it muster for a week, we like needed to clear the air faster than letting it just go and go and go and go. So it was get your stuff together, talk it out, fight it out, yell and scream, whatever needed to happen for each party to feel better about it and to come back to being friends again, I guess. Just yeah. like work it out. Yeah. We got to express our feelings and mm -hmm. talk them out, even if it was sometimes guided. Yeah. I know. It's very interesting to think about, you know, who stepped in and maybe yeah. put their arm around you and said, hey, it's okay. You know? And I think, yep. I think dad and mom watched a family member, a close family member of one of his family members go through a similar situation that I think probably prepared them in ways to handle what happened with me and knowing how in that moment, yeah, <laughs> in that moment, it was a game changer for the way they responded so lovingly. So yes, a hundred percent. I know yeah. that that's what help to them and I don't understand where the change came in the family from before us yeah because I know I never felt what has been described to me in that yeah. family dynamic that yeah. was happening before so mm -hmm. I don't know where that flipped the switch I don't know where the switch flipped I don't know if dad helped mend that but I do know him telling me at one time that he said that his family would never feel like that. Never. They would always feel loved no matter what happened. Yeah. And whatever decisions that they made. Yeah. I think it's funny how cycles go. I think what we do is, you know, if we're not conscious of it, we can create feelings like that of, of, um, like less desirable feelings. And then when we go to like do our own family, we're like, oh, we're going to do this incredible, <laughs> you know? And then yeah. if that next generation isn't conscious of the way it was done, if it's not pointed out to them and not taught to them, then I think that they revert back. And then it's just like this teeter totter, you know, I'm not real sure, but I feel like that, that I see that, you know? Yeah. Sometimes you, you fall back on what happened to you because that's the only thing you know. You're not consciously aware of what could have gone differently. And I feel like dad was always trying to better a situation or he was always aware of things. I was apologized to from my dad. Yeah. He always apologized for anything that he did. Yeah. Like he took responsibility. Yeah. He earned my respect. Yeah. And I earned his respect. It was a two-way street. Yeah. There wasn't, it was never told to me, you not, you must respect me. Yeah. No. He earned my respect. Yeah. He knew when he needed, you know, so he was definitely all about the relationships. He just was smart about the, how people worked and, and things like that. And he definitely built those and. He loved, he loved it. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Another question is what was going on in your life as you were going through this time with Jesse? I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but. What was going on? I just graduated. I mean, we were hanging out a lot of the time. 
so some of the times we weren't really hanging out, you would do your own thing and I would do my own thing. But for the most part, we did hang out a lot. Yeah. Another question is how long had you been dating Jesse? So that's really for me. And I kind of dated him right at the end of the school year. And I swear, like, I mean, I'm not sure. So I've never really said this, but like, I feel like I got pregnant, like my first time, you know what I mean? Which it was for sure within the first couple of weeks of it happening, you know, because I remember, you know, school used to get out in the very beginning of June or end of May, right? The very beginning of yeah. June. And it was senior slough day in May. And it was senior slough day. That was the first, you know, incident. The first thing that happened for me. And that I was like, what? And, um, and then I was, I was pregnant by June. Yeah. So it was, it would happen very quickly for me. So yeah, there's, there was that. And then, and then the next, the next part of that question says, did you like him or did, did you think he was good or not good for you? Like, what did you think? And what did you like? Did you like him? Did I, or yeah. you? you, me? Yeah. I liked Jesse. Yeah. He had this way of, he's very likable. Mm-hmm. He's very accepting. He's very loving. And so for me, I mean, yeah, you guys are going to, I mean, you, we hear all of the things that he did that was not right or whatever you want to call it, but he'd reel you back in. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know if that's. Which is why it lasted so freaking long with, yeah. in the face of so much crazy. And he had a way, he was a very good manipulator. Yeah. Very congenial. Um, always made you laugh. Yeah, literally just, you know, if you were with him, you were having a good time for yep. the most part, unless you were fighting. <laughs> unless there was I never issue. Really, well, I guess I, I fought with him later, so it wasn't that this at this point, but um, I don't feel like I ever really had those those moments in the beginning where I would fight with him or anything like that because I didn't have a reason to. Yeah. I didn't really know what was going on. Yeah. There was, there was parts of your relationship that I didn't know about. I was not aware that you were having, even having sex. Yeah. Um, so I didn't know that part of that until yeah. you were pregnant. And I was yeah. like, what, yeah. what are we talking? What, what? Yeah. Um, so, but he is very playful. He's very fun. He's very, he's always wanting to have, I don't even know how to, ex to explain that to you, but. He also like helped me come out of my comfort zone. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, he helped me. So he's not all, I mean, yeah, he did some horrible things, mean, horrible things, mm -hmm. but he also has a good heart. He does. Yeah. And I think that's part of why. <laughs> That's why, you know, like you said, it lasted so long and why there was, there was, I mean, he was hanging around our family a lot. He was building those relationships that I'm talking about. Yeah. He was uh, doing all of those things. He was sneaky. There were some things where I would question. He also made you question your truth mm -hmm. a lot. Mm -hmm. He would alter, you. like you say, he mm -hmm. would alter your truth make you think that it was really something else that you saw or that you felt or that whatever it may be so that he was guiding you to think what he wanted you to think. Yeah. He was very good. Also, I would say at, at pacifying relationships yep. so that you didn't get concerned. Yeah. Oh yeah. You know? So he just, he just was very skilled with people. And honestly, yep. you know, if he only used it for good, good night. Can you even imagine where he would have, it's just crazy. He is, he's very talented that way. Yeah. Yeah. He is. Okay. He's, yeah. Mm -hmm. Another question, how, and some of these questions kind of overlap because the people who asked them aren't the same people, right? Okay. And so if th th something else, you know, is to be said around it. 
How did your pregnancy change the family dynamic in your observation? And did it change anything for you personally? Not really. I don't feel like it did. Yeah. I don't know. I just, it was just more exciting. Yeah. You know, there was going to be a baby and, and just adding more to the family for people to, I don't even know. I don't even feel like it changed. I guess it did change a little bit because, you know, Misha was moved out. They moved out and lived in Cedar City for a little while before they moved to all the different places. So instead of just going into a room to talk to her, I had to like go and find her. There was no cell phones. There was no, yeah. Yeah. you know what I mean? So, um, so that kind of changed a little bit. Of course, you know, when you're missing that one person that's always been there in your family, that changes your family dynamics. So of course it changed it, but I don't feel like it changed it in a way that she wasn't around. She still was around quite a bit. She still was involved. We were still hanging out, especially me and her. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Well, and I think, I think it changed our family dynamic in a way that um, allowed us to like deeply, deeply bond and have each other's backs in a way. Do you remember when we would, sometimes we would come home from church and dad would talk to us and he would say, so-and-so at church asked, asked this and this and this. And he said, I want to teach you something right now. The kind of answers I gave her are different answers than I would give someone who I know really cares. Yes. Because she only wants to know because of gossip and I know it and I feel it. And so I just give her real, you know, kind of placid top of the surface answers and you're going to experience that too. And when someone really cares, I'm going to give them different answers. Yep. Those are the people who I'm going to, you know, tell the, you know, the real, the real things too. And so I think it, in a way was teaching us a lot about how to, you know, hold and protect the bond that we have and that we have each other's backs and that there is just nothing that's going to break that. Like, I'm not going to go talking to someone about your personal inside things that has, doesn't deserve to know. For sure. Yeah. So I think in a way, like, I, 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 I appreciate you saying what you said, because like, as far as just like mom, dad, kids, household type of thing, it's oh, not yeah. like par parents went into like being a stress case. And then all of a sudden your life was changed forever. You know what I mean? It wasn't like that. But I think in a way it did start to solidify, it was really an opportunity and it solidified a bond between all of us that became even more unbreakable because when you go through hard things and you come together during hard things, you have such an opportunity. Yeah. Yeah. For sure. Yeah. And yeah, an opportunity to teach an opportunity to learn, to love, um, and you mm -hmm. talking about that, it was always, it was never my truth to tell. Yeah. That's how I, I mean, yeah, I'm behind you 100%. I know exactly what's going on. I know everything about the situation, but mm -hmm. I knew it was never my truth to tell. Right. Somebody asked a question. It was a very vague answer. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not like I lied or anything like that, but I didn't give them the full truth because it wasn't my truth to tell. Yeah. Never was my. Yeah. Well, your, your, your truth was your truth, but yeah, you're right that there are people on the outside who really like want to dig for information. And we just really learned like, it doesn't no like they're not mm -mm, mm -mm. the people who are with you to the end and are the ride or die, talk to them till the cows home, come home, <laughs> you know what I mean? Yeah. Invite them into the circle. But yep. the minute that you feel someone is, you know, just kind of on the outside being a gossiper and we learned how. That was a definitely a survival technique, I think, for us, you know? Well, yeah, I, I would say as a survival technique and also a respect mm -hmm. to the person's truth. Yeah. Whose it was. Yeah. Exactly. You know, you kind of were taught that too, so that you knew that if you were, if something was happening to you in the same, ass, you know, a different way or whatever like that, you knew your hat family had your back. Yeah. You could tell them anything you wanted. Yeah. They wouldn't go be telling your truth unless, yeah. you know. Yeah. Um, yeah. 
so that was just another thing. It was just an open space and nobody, you didn't go blabbing. Yeah. It literally carried over into so many things. I had something just pop in my head that's so trivial and tiny, but just to give you an example, uh, when we were moving one time, I was, I had one of April's beds. I think she was probably traveling or doing whatever it was that she was doing in her adventurous life. And she kept one of her beds at my house. And when we moved, it still had these tags on the side that I would, when I made the bed, I, you know, just put it with the mattress protector. I just kind of kept it there. And the person who was moving with me went to pull those tags off. And I was like, no, 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 no. Those don't, don't pull those off. And they're like, well, what? Like, it's not, it's, you don't need. And I was like, okay, hang on. This is like my sister's bed. And they're like, but you don't need a tat. And I'm like, it's not mine. It's not mine to do. It's not mine to touch. It's not mine to like alter. Like it's, it was just a level of respect. And so that's just something that's so tiny, but it's like in that same way, we show up in the big ways. It's not, it's, if it's not yours, right. If it's, there's such a level of respect that you get to hold for each other. Yeah. And that allows those deep bonds too. Nobody alters the respect. I mean, yeah, if you, I mean, some, I guess sometimes there are times where something happens and you know what I mean? But you also admit, forget, forgive whatever needs to happen. But for the most part, we just, that's just there. It's just like, I mean, it was taught. So I don't even know how it's not really spoken. Mm Mm-hmm. Okay. Next question says, what was going on for you? People want to know about the car. (laughs) What was going on for you when you gave me your car to drive? I don't know. I just felt like it was such a short time and she needed it. Yeah. She only had it for a few months. But it was, it was like brand new to you. I know. It's fine. (laughs) I don't even know. I I. I mean, you tell the, you've told the story a few times lately and it makes me ball every time I hear it. So it's just yeah. one of those things that was, yeah. But for me, like inside, I'm pretty sure my dad sat me down and kind of said, Hey, shell, like he does, you know, this could be really helpful and cool. I don't even know where the idea came from. I don't know if it was dad's idea or my idea, or if we were like came together but I do know that I was really pissed off. I was really upset that you had to walk carrying that little baby. That yeah. really hurt me. Yeah. And I didn't want you to have to ever do that again yeah. and depend on anyone else for anything. And I wanted you to be able to feel strong. so that you could make the decisions that you wanted to make and you weren't being held nothing was held over you like I remember a story of you telling me later you probably I don't know if you remember this but you took my car you had my car and you were you called me one time and you were like I'm so scared because Jesse called and said that he's gonna take the tires off the car he's just gonna leave it on blocks I'm like I don't care it's fine he does whatever we'll get new tires like but all he's doing is using it as he I just felt like he was using things over your head and that's the only thing I keep thinking about I keep thinking like where did the idea come from why did it happen like what was going on but I do remember feeling like I didn't want you to feel like you were trapped like you had someone was holding something over you that you felt like you had to do something a certain way to be able to get a ride or to be able to be taken care of or to go to the grocery store and to take care of my little girl. You know, she was yours, but she was really, really special to me. And I loved her so much that I wanted her to be able to have everything she deserved. So for me, giving you something for a couple of months was no sweat off my back. I still had a way to drive. I still had a way to get where I needed to go. I was still taken care of. So to give some somebody that impacts their life and helps them be a better person or helps them to be able to take more control, 
it's not a big deal. Yeah. And you know what, Chell? That's exactly why it wasn't that big of a sacrifice for you is because you felt all the things that you so beautifully just described and had me in complete tears, you know, and, and I feel like that is your gift because you see how life is for someone else. And then you realize how much power you have in that space. And that you did exactly what you described for me. You did exactly that. I had so much power because I didn't have to depend on someone else. Yeah. And I didn't have to sit next to the creepy people on the city bus, honestly. Yeah. So much freedom. It was amazing. Like, I know, you know, I'm grateful for that. Yeah, I do. I know, you know, that I know, you know, that was a big deal for me. I just thank you for being that selfless person. You're so welcome. (laughs) Okay. How did you see your role with me? Like, as a protector or, you know, what, how did you view that? Uh, I guess in a way a protector, I don't know if I, I mean, it was to a point though, like we were friends, yeah. we're friends. Yeah. So it's a tricky, that's tricky for me because we're friends and I know like if you would have told me you needed something or protecting of, heck yeah, I'm going to come in and protect and take care of or do whatever I need to do. Yeah. Fight down the demons or what, fight down the guy or fight down this or fight that whatever I needed to do to that you wanted. Yeah. Yeah. But I love how you said that, that we were just friends first. Yeah, we were, we were friends. Yeah. So it was just more of a friendship. Yeah. So I was there. I had your back. I did what I needed for you. Yeah. So if you would have told me, that's the thing is, is like, yeah, if you would needed the protecting, yeah, I would have protected, but was I necessarily looking myself as a protector? No, I was looking at myself as, as she's my sister and my friend. Yeah. Okay. The next question, I'm going to ask two questions at once because they're really similar. Was it hard for her when she knew your husband wasn't the person you thought he was? Actually, I guess we'll just answer that first. <laughs> So that's a hard question for me because I don't feel like the truth was there for me for a while, for a long time. I don't know if that's going to make sense to people because I feel like when things happened and I was talked to by him and manipulated, the truth in my head was altered so much that I didn't feel like he was what he was at that moment that makes sense yeah so it wasn't until later in life yeah that I knew the whole truth I guess I did know when you told me in the car when we were driving and I remember that being so awkward for me like but I remember like sitting there when you said that you asked that question and I just kind of was like because it was silent for a while and it was just me thinking like just thinking about it like really like that's what it was because when he talked to me and he he said whatever he said to me and he made me believe that it was totally something different I was very naive I'm gonna say that to everyone (laughs) everyone on here I was a very naive person And I think some people would just, you know, I didn't see exactly, I did not get and open the door to the, to the car that, or the bed or whatever you're saying. Because for me, it was, he was, they were in a car. So describe, describe what you're talking about. So she's talking about when she caught him in action, like with another girl and she, she, they were up the mountain at a party and she opened up the door to a car and she saw what she saw, which was probably like fully clothed. I, no, they weren't even, I didn't even get to the door to open it. Oh, okay. He popped out. 
Okay. Because I think someone knew that I was there. Oh, okay. And went and said something. Got it. Because this, this is the second part to that question. It says, how did she feel about keeping his infidelity from you when she found out he lied to her about already telling you and so forth? So we're already diving into that. So that's why I was going to ask the question in the two parts, but we're already in that. Okay. Um, so I didn't ever really see exactly what was happening. And because of the way that he dis- he told me and he talked me down off and Threat. I I don't remember really being threatened, but I'm pretty sure it was probably more of like, if you do this, then this and this could happen. Yeah, that's a threat. I know, <laughs> but to me, <laughs> I didn't feel like I was threatened. Yeah, you know what I mean. Yeah, and that's the thing about it is that's the way it was for me. I, to me, he just made it, it felt like reasoning. Yeah, instead of a threat. Yeah. 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 So I guess I need a little. Yeah. Whatever. Anyways. So. <laughs> <laughs> for me, I never really saw them. I don't think I ever even saw the girl. Okay. In the car. Yeah. I knew there was someone else in the car. Yeah. But it was dark. Yeah. And like, I didn't even, I don't even think she got out of the car until I was gone. Mm-hmm. Because he like walked me back to my car with his arm around me. We were talking, we were chatting. He was, you know, telling me all of the things he wanted me to hear or believe or whatever it may be that he wanted the story to be. Yeah, yeah. I don't remember the words that were said. I remember the actions. I remember the feelings. Um, and I remember leaving there thinking, okay, he's going to take care of the situation. He promised he would talk to me about it. He's going to take care of everything. And then I remember him coming to me a few times, days after, like the next day and the next day, everything's fine. I've talked to her. She knows everything. She's okay with it. Let's just not bring it up. Um, We don't want to make it a bigger deal than it already is. Um, Basically just reassuring me. He would always talk to me every once in a while about it. Just, I think making sure where the waters were for him is what I'm thinking about now. Cause he would ask me questions like, have you talked to her? Have you thought any, you know what I mean? Or anything else like yeah. that. It was very, mm-hmm. there Good. was some mm-hmm. head things going on with that guy. Yeah. So, so here's a question for you. Did he say to you, if you tell her she'll lose the baby? I think so. Probably mm-hmm. she'll get so stressed and mad and But it's so weird that in the same, and I, trust me, he tried to talk me into that I was cheating on his friend with him and so forth. And it just, it just deflected everything off of him. And when you're naive, you don't know. And so I feel like what's interesting is that if he's telling you that it'll stress her out and she'll lose the baby, uh, hello, well, wouldn't it stress her out if you told her? Yeah. You know, like, no, I didn't even like, I I know. You're just young and naive and you just listen to, and he just has a way, man. He can, he just has a way. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah. Because, um, because Shelly, I, I mean, I don't know if this is something that you did or didn't want to talk about, but I feel like there was another incident that happened and I'm actually wondering when this happened because you told me something else happened for him when you were in the kitchen and he proposed, made a proposal to you. We could talk about it because the question, you know, the question is really, it wasn't hard for you when you, when she knew your husband wasn't the person you thought he was. And, and, and because of his manipulating power, I don't feel like we really understood who he, we thought he was until we were able to a put all of our stories together and where we were able to like say things out loud it really allowed us to the space to see it for what it was. I think there's a lot to be said about actually saying something out loud. Oh yeah. Because when we say something out loud and someone else hears it, we hear how absolutely crazy it is that we were believing that. Yeah. You know? Oh yeah. Your brain just plays tricks on you. Yeah, it does. He knew how to get that brain going pretty good too. I mean, like he knew how to 
have it think what he wanted it to think. And yeah, it's just weird. Like I sit and think back, like, how was I so naive? How was I not? I, I have no answers for that. I have no answers to say like how he was able to control my mind or make me think whatever he wanted me to think he was just really good at it. That's the only thing I can say. And also just because I didn't want to rock the boat. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, so that part, I guess, when I, when I very first, when we were talking about it in the car, I really, even though it was said and even though we talked about it, I still don't feel like it altered my view of him yet. Oh, yeah. Which is crazy because I will write in my journal something and then I'll be like, well, I don't really know if he's cheated. And I saw evidence in front of my eyes. It's crazy. It's just the way I don't even know how to explain that to anyone. I don't even know unless you've lived it and had things like that happen to you. I don't even know how to, ex- I do, I, if you can explain it to me, I'd be more than happy to have your explanation because I'd like to know. But for me, it's still, I mean, yeah, I knew he did something and it was horrible and it wasn't right. And it wasn't something that's supposed to happen, but it still didn't make me look at him any differently. And I think maybe it was because I already lived that part of it and deep down I probably really like assumed you know what I mean because I didn't have I didn't like know for a hundred percent but I'm pretty sure I knew what was happening but also at the same time like I don't I don't even know how to explain that so I don't feel like that altered my view maybe a tiny bit but it wasn't enough to like change things enough if that makes sense it wasn't until later quite a bit later in life that that altered that I really knew the truth like I really really deep down could see the whole entire picture and said wow are you kidding me oh my goodness yeah Yeah. (laughs) so tell us about the incident and try to tell us about do you know when it happened I don't I don't know when the timeline was the very vivid memory for me um I don't know where it was. I don't know where it fits in in the story. But I remember, I think we were having some kind of a dinner or something at mom at, ha- at the house at mom and dad's. And everyone was outside. I was in the kitchen getting something. And Jesse was in the kitchen. He came into the kitchen. It was later at night. I'm trying to think. Anyways, whatever. Maybe it was everyone was in different rooms or outside or something. No one was in there or within earshot. And he basically like leaned over to me and whispered to me. And he's like, you know, we should really make out because that would make me just totally jealous. Let's just do that. Cause that, and I was just like baffled and blown away. Cause I was like, no, I would never do that. What are you talking about? He's like, it would just be for fun. It would just be like a joke. It's really no big deal. And I'm like, yeah, it is. Like, what are you talking about? Uh-uh. No. Absolutely no. And I remember him, like, trying to, like, talk me into it or something. And I remember I just turned around and, like, walked away, shaking my head going, what just happened? Like, you know what I mean? But not really thinking that I was just like, whatever, you know? And I, the way that he approached it and the way that he said it to me, you know, it's just a game. It's just kidding, da, 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 whatever. And I, nothing happened. So I didn't feel like I needed to talk about it to anyone. But now I'm thinking like, maybe if I would have said something to you, would that have validated anything for you at that point? I don't know where it was. And it was more in the beginning before it was Rocky. I know that because he was around, you know what I mean? And he was welcome. I mean, I'm not saying he was never, well, never mind. Anyways. Um, <laughs> mom, mom shook her finger at him a few times. <laughs> yeah. Um, so I don't know. I don't know when the timeline was, but I remember just being baffled and I just never even talked about that again or anything until way later. Yeah. I didn't know that until I started telling the story. So I started the podcast. 
Yeah. And you could have possibly told me and I forgot before, but it just, to me, it was like, because I think we learned some more things down the road about a different story. And I think that knowing that he said that to you might change the dynamics of this other story. And I think it's a very, a very important piece. Oh yeah. But, yeah. And so I think that the way that we talk about, you know, was it hard for her when she knew your husband wasn't the person you thought he was? I don't think we internalized who he was for a very long time. We didn't. <laughs> I like, didn't. That happened. And I mean, hello. Yeah. So it was years after I'd even seen him. Yeah. That I feel like I processed everything. Mm hmm. Then our brain kind of does that and says, uh, that would hurt me too bad right now. And I'm not, that's, we're not going there. We're not going there. And in a way, you know, our best protecting mechanisms inside of our brain and head also kind of get us into trouble and, you know, have us on a road longer than we should be. I think it's important. That's why I think it's very important for us to make sure that we do take action when we do recognize something. So many people feel uncomfortable and so they run away from it. And that is the exact reason why our brain can do that. Cause we say that feels uncomfortable and it's not a place I want to go. So I'm leaving. I'm not, I'm not going to, not going to entertain or talk about that or think about that. You have a lot of power inside your brain. It's a very, it's very cool that you can protect yourself that way, but it will yeah. end up hurting you more in the long run if you choose not to look at things. Oh yeah. Yeah. Okay. Next question. What can she see now about being a sibling in this family situation? Any part that she didn't see then? I mean, it's see, seeing things. Yeah. There's a ton of stuff that are like red flags are freaking flying everywhere. You know, <laughs> <laughs> it's like red flag city, but, um, those are the main things. Those are just the alarming things. Like there's some, been some memories that I've talked about that I was like, why didn't I say anything then? Or why didn't I do anything there? And why didn't I like, but then again, that goes back to me being the friend and you didn't feel like, I don't feel like you ever said you needed anything. Like you liked it. You liked what you, what was happening. You never expressed to me that there was a need for you to get out, be away, no longer go, any of that stuff, even at the very beginning. There was a couple of things, like the thing I told you about the other day, where I was like, trying to get you to come with me and you were not coming with me, but also because of his ideas, because of right. what he wanted. But you, yeah. we told were at a party. Okay. Yeah. But for the listener, we were at a party, and this was before. This was before, um, things really got serious. This was like right in the beginning, and he kind of locked me in a bathroom. The bathroom was like a big bathroom that was carpeted, so it felt kind of like a room. But he locked me in the bathroom at this party, and Shelly knew I was in there. And she was trying to get in and get me. And because of altered states, I was totally kind of out of it and just happy just to be where I was at. And it was just a really tricky situation. And Shelly just remembers feeling that protector role and wanting just to break the door down and not being able to get to me. I'm sorry to interrupt your thought process, Shell. No, you're fine. Anyways, with him, like him telling me everything was okay and I'm like telling him that I'm not believing him that I have to hear it from you and then you telling me that you're okay but I don't feel like you I really felt like you were okay because I never saw you I didn't get to see you mm -hmm. I didn't like you know I yeah yeah but we never talked about that yeah because I don't feel like it was, yeah, I don't know. I, I think your intuition knew in that moment, the, the road, 
<laughs> the road that was starting. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I remember yeah. just sitting there worried, like wondering. And it, I mean, it was at night. So I was like, mm-hmm. the older sister, the responsible sister, the one that needed to make sure the younger one was okay. Yeah. Not and, leave her. And you were doing the best you could. Your, your yeah. side of the door. And I was again, aloof and just not really as aware as I should have been that you were trying so hard Yeah, on the other side. But to why didn't we, I mean, that's another question. Why didn't we talk about that? Why wasn't it something that I asked you about later to make sure that you were okay, that you were okay with that situation or to prevent that situation again, if we needed to, or you know different things like that so for me like because he never made you feel like it was a bad situation no he never did he never had a way of making it all because that was very bad it was very like not okay that he did it the way he did and yeah yeah so in my mind I was already in the loop of it's okay this is an okay thing. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Next question. What parts of your story surprised your sister the most? Yeah. Some things that I found out later that were surprised and then later in Stuff life. That hasn't come up yet. Yep. Okay. So we'll get there. We'll get there. Yeah. Those are like the more, more surprising things. I think those were like the big the bigger things that made you look at all the little things and say, Whoa, wow, really? Like I didn't, I wasn't, you know, maybe I should have looked more into that or thought more about that or, you know what I mean? You kind of feel like not guilty, but also at the same time, like how was I not in tune or aware of more Yeah, kind of a thing? Okay. Were there pieces of your story that you experienced differently? I think it's really interesting how siblings in the same household can experience situations, parents, et cetera, in different ways. Meaning like my memory being different than yours. Yeah. If that's what they're asking, like the way things happened. Yeah. There are some things that Misha describes and how she describes them is, and I'm like, um, you get the gist of the story, but I remember this being this instead of that. So, um, yeah, I, there are a few things and a few memories, and I think that's just another way of our brain probably protecting us and altering it. Anything distinctly that you remember? Any story that you're like, mm, that's not how I remember it. Yeah, I wasn't driving grandpa's truck. What were you driving? Really? What did you drive? It wasn't grandpa's truck. Because I remember I keep trying to think back and think, how many times did I drive grandpa's truck? Because it wasn't that often. Oh my gosh. And so it was only a few times that I would drive grandpa's truck. So it wasn't my main source. And I may have drove it during the time that you had my car, but I don't distinctively remember that. Well, then what did you drive? I think we still had my gray car. The car I had before I bought that new car, that silver car. Was what? You even, you probably maybe, I don't know why you wouldn't remember it. Cause it's the one car that we did. We, mo- we hung out a lot in. I remember the white car a lot. <laughs> you only remember the white car because of its fun, it's fun accessories. That's a whole nother episode. Yeah. <laughs> well, do you remember me driving the citation? Yeah. Yeah. I just don't remember a gray car. It was and silver I, gray. I feel like I remember dad. That's telling the car me, that went to Vegas. Does that ooh, ring a bell? No. See how many things we block out. We probably had to sleep in that car. I think we slept we in that car. Because 
he told us that he would get a hotel room and then you know what that is a lie that's a freaking lie i just realized in this moment that's a lie what what's a lie him pulling up to every single hotel room and he would walk in and he would come out every time and say they don't have a room they don't have a room they don't have a room he's just not 21 he couldn't get a room he is a liar and then we went out and slept in the desert in the car because the hotels were full in sketch land yeah what a liar okay we don't need to go down and create another story but that my brain just barely fired something okay anyway that's interesting because i thought i remember dad telling me that you were going to be driving to grandpa's truck and i'm wondering if you traded the gray car in and only had to drive it the truck during that small period of time yeah i don't remember i don't remember yeah maybe it might have been yeah doesn't really matter much at this point but yeah and like how you said that you drove home in the van i know Ogden. i even as i was editing that i was like oh what I remember is actually the van was full of all my stuff and we had, would have had another car for our family. Right. Yeah. But I don't remember. I remember that I, we drove my car home. Yeah. So Cause my stuff was loaded in the van, but I remember grandpa's truck bringing your stuff home. Oh, wow. Wow. I, I guess I don't. Yeah. I don't remember. So like, is there big events that I remember differently? It's just, yeah, there are things that I remember differently than you, yeah. but their details, they're not mm -hmm. the big story. They're not the major part of the story. Yeah. Um, and I remember the things that affected me more than they affected you. You know what I mean? You, of course, remember your things that affected you. And I remember the things that affected me the most. Right. Um, but to say that I feel like it, it I, I don't think it, other than just those memories and different things like that, I don't think there was anything major. How do you two see this whole experience affecting your relationship today? I feel like it's brought us probably closer. It's, I don't think it changed anything necessarily like I would do this for you rather than I would have done it if it didn't happen. I just feel like we're closer together. We're able to talk through a lot of things and I think we've probably still had that close, you know what I mean? It's just a little bit closer than we were or different things like that. Yeah. I think when you share heartache and you're able to truly share it, like you don't keep it personal and, you know, individualize and, and let it separate you. But when you truly share heartache, I think it definitely intensive, intensifies your relationship. And I think that's something to remember as we go through our trials and as the people are around you supporting you like trust and know that it, those, those relationships and those things will be insanely more impacted. And you'll have such a bond with those people, whoever it is that's surrounding you and in your life, because you go through those things together. 100%. Yeah. Um, I also feel, I mean, it's just always been an understanding between the two of us. So it's not, not anything that's just yeah I could call you and tell you anything I know no matter what it was whether you agreed or disagreed mm -hmm. or whatever your nature is to fix it so you'd probably try to fix it a little bit but you would understand yeah you would still love me with you. yeah <laughs> you what I said I still sit with you in it yeah you would sit with me in it and then we would fix were, it uh, yeah <laughs> sometimes I have to tell you not yet we're not ready for that part yet let's just yeah. figure this part out first like yeah. we're not fixing anything yet um <laughs> but, but it's just, just one of those understandings like I know her I know exactly how she's going to react and what she's going to do for me and sometimes I can just go to her and be like don't say anything but here's this and this and this can we just like sit yeah mm -hmm. and then we and do. it's just it's just like what my dad did for me mm -hmm. this was after I mean this was in my own personal life later on in life um I was still I lived with my parents for quite a bit I consider myself lucky to be able to do that 
just because I got to be around them more, learn as much as I could from my dad and have the blessings of being with him later in his life when, before he left the earth. So, but I had come home and I was devastated and I was bawling. It was late at night and I just went straight to my room. I laid in my bed and I was just crying hysterically. And I'm pretty sure he could hear me. He was in bed. And the next thing I know is my dad is laying halfway on top of me with his arms around me, just embracing me. He did not say a word. I knew in that moment that I didn't have to talk to him if I didn't want to, but he would be there for me if I needed him, if I wanted to talk. But he just laid there. We just laid there for like an hour and a half. Yeah, I'm not sure I knew that story, but I knew yeah. I knew what you were going to say that dad did. I just knew he was going to lay by you and hold you and hug yeah. you or something, something to just, yeah. Let you know that you were safe and you were okay and that he loved you. Mm -hmm. No matter what, like you just, you didn't even have to act. That's the coolest thing though, is yeah. it wasn't, you didn't have to explain anything. You just yeah, got to. Mm -hmm. and be loved mm -hmm. and while you worked through it you knew someone was in your corner whether you wanted to tell them about it or not mm -hmm. yeah it's beautiful so cool so that's kind of carried on and I know that I could do that with either of my sisters like just to have that sometimes you just need that support that love that even if you don't want to say anything about it and you just need to work through it, you need to know that you're loved. You need to feel that love and you can get through anything. Yeah. The power of one person. Yeah. 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 All right. How this is, this is a question that jumps time. So we're, it's a little bit different question. How did the loss of a parent affect your relationship? So dad passed away. I'm trying to remember. Was it eight years? I think it was eight years after Taylor passed away. Eight years. You're right. So yeah, dad passed away eight years after Taylor passed away. And so the question is, how did you, how did the loss of a parent affect your relationship? Losing my dad was very sad. My dad was my best friend. Oh, I didn't know that would make me cry that much. <laughs> if anything, again, it would just make us stronger. I don't know. Like we just, but my dad was prepared us. Again, he's always looking out for the end. Like, I don't even know how to explain to you that he prepared me for his death hmm. in a way that looking back on that it blows my mind yeah well I think a lot of the things that he did to train us yeah um you know started when Taylor pass passes and we'll see we'll see a bunch of that um coming up on the podcast and I think he in a way walking us through that helped us walk through walk through his own passing. And then I think dad, you know, really sat with us. And I remember sitting and, and planning his funeral with him. And I remember being like, this isn't happening. We're not doing this. I am not planning this funeral. I'm not doing this, you know? And I was such a resistor. I was like, no. And he's, and he, I remember him holding my hand and looking at me and saying, Mish, we just have to do this. And then we don't have to talk about it again. You just need to know what my wishes are. And we, I promise we won't talk about it again because he knew I needed that like promise because for me, it was like an admission that it was going to happen. And I did not want to go there. I was, I was not okay with the idea. And I remember even calling home and you telling me that things had worsened and I could not even believe my ears. Like I, I really couldn't even believe I didn't want to hear, you know, what the truth was because it hurt too bad. Yeah. But 
you also need to tell the listeners that that the planning of his funeral and the things that he said was not in a big group. Yeah. He did it one-on-one with each of us. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Which allowed us to hear what we needed to hear, to get through what we needed to get through yeah. and process our feelings and our thoughts and say our things and do our things to be okay. Yeah. You know, like have our last times, like when he was still really mentally there to, um, cause at the very end, he kind of, his memory would come in and out, but, um, he did it before it got that to that point. And he used to, ca- he catered to each of us our own ways. And he did it at the same at the very end. Like Misha needed to hear what she needed to hear. I needed to hear what I needed to hear. And April needed to hear what she needed to hear to be. Yeah. I don't even know if you want to say, okay. So just to make it through, Mm -hmm. to look back and say, I regret nothing. Yeah. I have no regrets. There's Mm -hmm. nothing I didn't say. There's nothing I couldn't have done. Like anything. Yeah. I'm totally resolved. I'm totally okay with that. And I'm lucky. It's so interesting to me because I think if anything, you know, it helped us to grow closer because we helped function for each other in roles that dad would have functioned for us, you know, and because we were so close to him, we could give each other advice. Like we could see each other's point of views differently. And that's, you have advantages as siblings in that way. You, you can think through life with patterns you were given when you were very young and if that's healthy for you that's great and if you need to reinvent them like we kind of touched on that my dad did a little bit of you can reinvent them and you have the power to do that yes so that's that's there for you but all the spaces that I would have maybe spent with dad are spent with you or with April or with mom Uh so I think it's important to point out that we have a capacity for love And we have a need and a desire to love, like to actually, as a human being, reach out and love another person. And when you love someone so deeply that they're, that that them leaving you, okay, like a passing graduation, we talk about it like that. When that happens, you still have that capacity to love the person that you loved so much before they left. You still have the capacity to love. So love the people who are closest to that person as well. So like for your siblings, I think it's very easy to kind of like in some families where maybe they would implode and, and take on the hurt on their own. You know what I mean? And it is miles better for you to gather and to celebrate. And we will walk through step-by-step through grief that's coming up on the, on the podcast with Taylor's passing. And so we'll walk through the how of how to do that and what that actually looks like. But if, if you commemorate and celebrate and do the things in their honor, and you're doing that together, that only brings you closer together with people who have the same connection over the same person. And that is an opportunity yet again. Yes. Okay. So Shelly, one last beautiful question and anything else, of course, that you want to add that you're open to. Okay. But what would you say? This is my question for you. This is the question I wrote for you. What would you say to someone who is struggling with their relationship with their sister? What would you say? Try to fix it. Yeah. I don't know. They can be such amazing relationships that I don't understand. I just, I can't fathom going and being so mad at in anyone in my family for a long period of time and not talking to them. I can't do that. That's not for me. So for me, I would say try to work it out. Try to be the one that needs to, I, I guess everyone needs to s- swallow something. Someone 
you need to get to a, a ground where each other is okay with whatever has been in the past and agree to let it go or agree to talk it out and figure it out together instead of apart. You know, uh, if, even if you have to have a mediator who comes in to help you work through that part at first. And I know that there's a lot of things that people feel like they want to say that they need to be heard for them to be able to get over things. And so maybe set, a, I mean, if you don't want to do it with people and you feel like you guys, you can handle it, set a timer, take t- turns, yell and scream, get it out, like yeah. figure it out so you can fix that and get past that part so that you can love again yeah. and grow together. And next time when something happens or you figure out, what you need and you tell them that they figure out what they need they tell you that and you support each other instead of being against each other all the time like I feel like that's sometimes what happens and people aren't validated enough or they don't get to say their piece so make time to say your piece write it in a letter if that's the first thing that needs to happen rewrite the letter rewrite the letter if you have to write it like 10 times to make it be say whatever you feel like you need to be said if they're not listening send the letter and let it be but then you've healed you've said your piece invite them to say theirs Mm, that is so good because you don't want to make it feel like that you're the only one that gets to say something and everything's okay they need to be able to get their stuff and their story out and they need to be able to be heard as well so Maybe, I, I don't even know, some of them could, you know, at the beginning of the letter say, I really want to try to mend this. I want to have a, the best relationship that we can come to an agreement on. I feel like there's some things that I would like to say, you would like to say, and you could even start off with a simple letter like that. I want mm-hmm. you to be able to say your piece. I want to say my piece. I want us to be able to, to do this. How do you think, or how do you think we could come together do you think we could do it just us or do you think you would feel comfortable more comfortable writing it down in letters back and forth do you feel we need a mediator somehow you just need to open that door to get the ball rolling and sometimes you know it may take a little bit of time for the other person to want to come to the table but you have opened the door And then I guess if you just do a little short letter like that, maybe, and you still want to say your piece, you could say, I hadn't heard from you. I want to be able to, for us to start healing. I would like to uh, send you this letter and here's my piece. And at the end, invite them again to send you a letter. Sometimes saying things in a letter allows you to get everything down and said that you feel like you need to be said sometimes when you're talking I don't sometimes I don't get I don't get my point across so for me to write it down sometimes is better because I get it all out and then I've said everything that I feel like it needs to be said do you feel like too I feel like that owning your side your junk your stuff saying sorry for whatever you can because trust me I don't care who you are. And I'm, you're talking to the queen of right. I'm telling you, you have stuff to own, you know? So we usually, we usually have to own something before that's what kind of can soften other people is when they can see that you are in a state where you are, you're going to, you're going to come to the table with a sorry, you're going to come to the table and be repentant and truly, truly wanting to fix it. And I think it goes back to the story of, you know, a girl being trapped in the bathroom and one of the sisters on the other side of the door, you know, and you might be that sister on that side of the door fighting for the sister inside for a long time while that sister's a little bit aloof in the bathroom, but don't give up. Like Never be, give up. Yeah. Be the girl who freaking bangs down the door, knock on the door. Like Shelly was such a freaking pest to him. be that you know and and of course you know 
if people are toxic and you need to set boundaries, I think it's important that you let them know that you still love them and you're, and you're there for them and in whatever way, and then invite them into, you know, a therapy situation, a therapeutic situation where you can have more help. You can have more help if it's, if it's at that situation. Yeah. But I think, did you have something else to say? Um, I'm just, sometimes that's making that first step helps. Sometimes us saying, oh, shoot, I shouldn't have done that. I'm really sorry. You know, I would like to hear how you feel about it or what I did that made you feel or how I could have acted differently. Those kind of things, even if that's all the letter needs to be at first. I, I don't even know. I mean, just even in the invite or the whatever, but sometimes like you reaching out and helping those people that may have the problems or may have the what you know like Misha said toxic it helps them to also if it's done in the right way and in a good way it could help them to heal that toxic it could help them to be better yeah, yeah it can it, help them to it gives them the car when they want them yeah it gives yeah. them the car it gives, it gives them, them the, the car. car they now have the power they now have the power and you can do that because before the toxic was the power. Yeah, exactly. And so now you're giving them something to heal with. Yeah. So it's interesting too, you know, with dad, and I don't know if he told you this, but he, he told me, dad told me that in his family never used to be a family that hugged. And when my father told me that, I mean, it was definitely in my teen years. I, I was beyond like disbelief. I was like, you, no, mm -mm, that's not even possible. With how much I hug my cousins. It's not possible that dad's family didn't hug. And he told me that it was that he decided that he wanted to start hugging his family. <laughs> and he just would hug them. When he left and he said it was awkward and it was weird at first. And he just decided he wanted to hug. And, and then at the point when dad was telling me that it was like, wow, are you kidding me? Because that's all I knew of the Cox side of our family was love and hugs. And so you have so much power in the way that you show up in your family. Be the sister on the side of the door. Be the sister that offers the car. Be the sister that writes the dang letter. And hug your people. Hug your people. Yeah. Because <laughs> it's worth it. It's worth Hugs it. are healing. Yeah. Hugs are healing. I was thinking the other day, yesterday, thinking what changed in the family? Like, what did dad do? Because I know it was dad. Because he had told me that he never wanted his children to not feel love. That he wanted them to always feel like they were accepted and loved no matter what happened in, with whatever. And so what you just told me right there, what he told you, is what altered that in his family. Because grandma and grandpa Cox are the most loving people. That's all I know them as. And I think they probably would have hugged us and loved us as grandchildren because that's just kind of, as we get older, we kind of develop, you know, like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. you want to love, you want to fix things and do things differently. But him just starting to hug people just made everyone hug. <laughs> he was a good hugger. <laughs> <laughs> I miss those. Me too. So I want to close just with this quote that says, a sister is worth a thousand friends. And literally, you are worth a thousand friends to me. You are to me too. April is. And my April. And April is worth a thousand friends. And it just depends on what you build. 
Yep. I love you, Shell. Thanks for showing up here today and walking this crazy road with me. You're welcome. Always. <laughs> I love you. I love you. My I love you got cut off a little bit. <laughs> that was such a fun conversation with my sister. And you know what's funny is if we sit and, and talk about our life and break it apart with other people that were there, we start to get a more complete and whole picture. Isn't it interesting <laughs> how much our brain comes in and, I don't know, takes over and helps us <laughs> remember the situation, you know, a little differently sometimes. Anyway, you know, I wanted to make a little shout out to one of our listeners named Shelly, a different Shelly than my sister. And she was telling me that she's so grateful that this content is digestible with a story because for her, she wouldn't do like anything in the self-help genre if it wasn't attached to a story. And so I'm really grateful that I was given the inspiration to include the story because it's it's allowed me to bring different things to the surface because I'm telling this story. So I'm I'm with you, Shell. <laughs> Thanks for being such a loyal and good listener. You're so awesome. I wanted to remind you that we are doing some really cool things in the Mindset Check podcast group on Facebook. So you can join that Facebook group and it's a really safe and awesome community. But the thing that I wanted to remind you of is that I'm dropping in there with you live if you want to. If you want to talk about anything from the podcast, any breakthroughs you've had, or if you need me to help you move through something. I've had friends that have asked me to help them move through their anxiety and their anxiousness. And we can talk about that or we can talk about any concept that you've seen from, you know, learned from the podcast and you still kind of are unsure about it. Maybe you want to walk through your affirmations together or we want to talk about creating your future. Whatever it is, we can drop in there and just kind of do a one-on-one. -on -one. So DM me. You can, you can email me or DM me. Email me at hello at myfriendmisha.com or DM me on Instagram at myfriendmisha or you can also um, send me a private message on Facebook. So any of those, and I would love to drop in with you there. They're really fun conversations. We'd love to have you there. Also, one of the things that I learned is that if this podcast has actual reviews written, like it promotes the podcast like 10,000 times to broader audiences. So if you haven't taken a time to write a review for the podcast, I would invite you to do that. You just scroll down until you see those stars and you can, you know, rate the star and then you can click to write a review. And I would really, really appreciate that. Even if it's only a couple of sentences, I would love that. Thank you guys so much for being with us today. My deepest hope is that being able to look at your life while you're somehow looking at ours or mine, it allows you to see what you want to create for your life as well. Remember that you have the power to be the difference maker in your family. Until next time, my friend. Thank you.